Okay. When did your family first come to the U.S.? In the late 1800s, my mother's family came, and my mother was born just shortly after they came. Mm -hmm. My father came when he was a pretty young man, I'm not sure exactly how old he was, probably somewhere between 18 and 20. Mm -hmm. And that was roughly just before the turn of the century, I think. Um, where did they come from? They both came from the same area, which was then Russia. Mm -hmm. Possibly now Ukraine. Possibly at one time part of Poland, but the boundaries have uh, shifted over the years. Mm -hmm. We generally consider that they came from that. And um, where did they go to when they first came here? Uh, my mother's family first went to Finland, New Jersey, mm -hmm. where there was a Jewish cooperative farming community. Um, which evidently had a very interesting history. Um, my understanding is that it, the community didn't do well because they were cheated by the people who had been there and who owned the property and they moved from there to the city and they moved my mother's time they moved to Philadelphia. Uh, probability is that other families moved to New York or to Baltimore which were thriving Jewish communities at that time. My father came straight to Philadelphia as far as I know and he was related to my mother's family. I'm um, understanding is that he came and originally probably lived with them. Mm -hmm. He met my mother. Mm -hmm. um, why did they leave to come to the U.S.? They were part of a major migration of Eastern Europeans, uh, the great extent Jews, who were leaving that area, basically because they were disputed. There was a great deal of anti Semitism and prejudice. And specifically, young men would be because they would have been drafted into the Russian army where they would have been badly mistreated. So they would emigrate before that happened. Um, did either of your parents tell you any stories of the uh, of the old country or anything like that? Hardly ever. Hardly ever? No, they did not talk about hmm. what things that's been going on before. Why do you think that is? Um, I think they, they had unpleasant experiences mm -hmm. in the and were not interested in reliving it. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. I don't really know, but this whole interest that young people have today in, in the past and in family lives and all that. That's, a, that's relatively new. That didn't exist. Uh, 
there was, uh, in that generation especially, it was really a break with the past. Uh, they were not interested in, in maintaining connections or what have you. Now, my, I know my father had some connection with his family back uh, there. I used to send packages back to them for a period of time. But there was not any nostalgia for, for the past that I do. Um, where were you born? In Philadelphia. In Philadelphia. And what, what's your exact birthday? October 31st, 1921. Okay. What's your earliest memory? I do not have a single memory that stands out of all. Nothing? No. I was born in South Philadelphia and we moved to West Philadelphia before my first first time. I have no memory of that at all. I'd be surprised if you did. <laughs> mm -hmm. And we lived in the same house, actually until the 1940s, when I got married and moved out. My family still lived there for another, probably close to 10 years before they moved out of that house into a different house, when all the children were born. I was a small school, and it was a neighborhood that was mixed Jewish and Irish, and um, I just remember playing in the street. We would, I remember going to school. I have a vague memory of going to school for the first time when I learned that my name wasn't Bob. That your name wasn't Bob. Yeah, because that's what my family always told me. Why is that? Well, the best guess we have, we don't really know, but guess is that my grandmother lived on the same street as we did, mm -hmm. several houses down, and we would go back and forth between the houses. And my cousin lived with my grandmother, mm -hmm. and his name also was Scott. And my Yiddish name is Fiber. And I can only guess in order to keep clear distinction between Phil, my cousin, who was older than I was, and therefore had the right to the name, that they either called me by my Yiddish name, which they translated into a Bob, <laughs> and somehow that became the common name for me. So I still have a few relatives, two cousins, um, what has your education been? I had kindergarten in eight years. I had William F. Howard Elementary School in West Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. I then had four years as a commuting student to Temple University mm -hmm. in Philadelphia. I then went into the Army. In the Army, I actually went to radio school and radar school. Mm -hmm. When I came out of the Army, I started teaching in Philadelphia Public School and went to Temple again in the evening and got my master's degree. Mm -hmm. And then... And so what did you get your master's degree in? I got my master's degree in, in curriculum. Mm -hmm. 
that what you're studying undergraduate also? My undergraduate is science and math education. Mm -hmm. So you've known for a very long time that you wanted to be a teacher? Uh, actually, at the time I went to college, there were fairly limited choices mm -hmm. for Jews. Mm -hmm. right? If I had a choice possible at that time, <coughs> I would probably have chosen engineering. Mm -hmm. So I was discouraged from thinking about engineering as, at that time, a profession for Jewish work. Mm -hmm. Teaching was the most likely thing. Mm -hmm. Anyway, after teaching in the Philadelphia School for three years, then I retired as an instructor at Temple. Mm -hmm. Back in the program, I had been a student. Mm -hmm. And I taught there for two years. And then since I now felt that I would continue in the career as a college professor, I went to NYU to get my PhD. Mm -hmm. And I was there for two years and got my PhD. Great. Um, when you originally went to the Army, were you drafted or did you volunteer? Pearl Harbor. What was the December of my senior year? I finished school in June and I heard about a program that I could use my science background in. And I went down and looked at it. And what year is it? This is June of 42. June of 42. Um, what were your various positions while in the Army? After training, that is. Well, I went to the tour program and then went. I went to Fort Crowder, Missouri for basic training. And then went set to West Palm Beach, Florida to grade our school. And then went to Western Ontario, Canada to advance grade our school. And then went back to Florida, was assigned to a platoon, and received combat training out in the Everglades. I then rode a train across the country to San Francisco and got on a boat. Went to New Guinea for a short period and then to Biak Island in the Dutch East Indies and then to the Philippine Islands. Uh, for a small period on Lady Island and then on Mindoro Island where I was when the war ended. Uh, and I was a uh, technical sergeant when I finished. I understand that you received a Purple Heart. I was on a ship going from Lady Island to Mindoro Island as part of a uh, convoy. Uh, we came into Lady Island shortly after Lady had been invaded by the infantry and the Marines. And the combat had moved out of the area we were in. But the Philippines were still in very strong contestation. And when our convoy went out to sea, it started being attacked by Japanese airplanes. And they would come over about a dozen planes at a time and would shoot down and space our ships, and we would shoot back at them. And one day, a kamikaze plane came over. You, you, you know about yeah. kamikaze? And this plane came and went into a dive and went right into the middle of the ship next to it. Mm -hmm. And the ship exploded completely. There was nothing left of it but junk floating in the water. And some pieces of it 
actually landed in an airship. And a couple of our people were, were wounded by pieces of this, but I wasn't. The next day, we were again attacked by a dozen planes or so, and they came over scraping. And I had been on deck helping to spot the gunners. You know, we would watch for approaching planes and we would give the position of the planes so that our gunners would know. And when these planes came shooting over us, I ducked under a truck that was on the deck. And a shell hit the side of the truck and exploded into the trap off, and three of us were hit at that time. And I got hit in the arm. I got about a half a dozen pieces of shot in the car. Mm -hmm. They're still in there. Did you see this as far? Mm -hmm. One large piece was taken out mm -hmm. later. One piece is still in there, and if I run my finger across it, I can feel a little bump right here. Uh, but I, I, I went to first aid and had it treated, and I, I, I didn't go up to the state on duty. And we landed, uh, I think two days later, we landed in disembarked. And then we went to sit up our equipment. And we stayed there for the rest of the week. So it was not a serious thing. Very minor. Still, no, incredible story. Um, <clears throat> what are the three most important things that you learned in the Army? Um, I had never traveled before I was in the Army. I had been part of a really restricted group of people. When going to college, I stayed in my horizons considerably in terms of the people I met, but there were still people from a basic, hardly certain class and orientation. When I went into the Army, I met people from all over and became friendly with them. Spent a, a, over the year, spent a lot of time with, with people who were very, very different from me in their background. The way they talk, the way they talk. And I enjoyed that. Actually, I liked that. I also got to travel a great deal. Went from home to New Jersey, to Missouri, to Florida, to Canada, to California, across the ocean in the ship. So I found that all very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I guess learning electronics, which I did at the time, uh, was very I became very good at it. And I was the uh, I was the chief technician for our uh, radar. Uh, and I still understand basic circuitry, but the fact of the matter is that the changes in electronics have been so much yeah. that I, I really uh, do not open up a, a piece of equipment and, and find it familiar. Whereas. <laughs> Beforehand, I could look at any piece of equipment and, and immediately know exactly what it was working, uh -huh. what each part was doing. But but it's changed now. But so today, with I all these chips with trillions of transistors. Yeah. yeah. And we, if we would have a piece of equipment which would have as many as 50 tubes in it. Yeah. You know, and that would be a complicated piece of equipment. Yeah. 50 tubes fit onto one transistor very easily. Yeah. So these are much, much more complicated pieces of equipment. The basic science is the same, yes. but it's, it's much, much more complex because there's so much of it. Yes. Yes. <coughs> yes. Um. <coughs> um, when and where did you and Grandma meet? We met when we were in college. I was a senior and she was a freshman. Mm -hmm. And she was a freshman actually in the same program that I was, the secondary education program. Uh, she later switched out of secondary education, elementary education, which was a different program, but that wasn't for the next year. So we knew each other, but we didn't have any particular relationship. Mm -hmm. 
I had noticed that she was a very pretty woman at the time, but I, I didn't, we didn't develop any particular relationship. After I came home from the war, and I was taking my courses at Temple, I had a paper to write, and I decided to go into the main Philadelphia library, which is downtown. And I went into the library, as I walked into the library, there was a whole big set of steps that go up to the main floor. So I was at the bottom of those steps, and Esther and her girlfriend were coming down to the top. And we recognized each other. And we stopped to talk. And we talked. We stood there for quite a while talking. And then I had a car. And I said, how did you come? And they said, oh, we came on the bus. I said, well, I'll take you home. So we got in the car. Instead of writing your essay. Huh? Instead of writing your essay. <laughs> Instead of working on my papers. So. And I took them home. And that, after that, we, 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 we set up a date and we started dating. Mm -hmm. And we developed our relationship. Cool. Um, what year were you mar married? 47. 47. And how long after that did you have your first child? Well, it was very interesting. We had very good friends. One of the other professors at Temple who were just a little bit older than you were. And they had two kids. And they were telling us that they got married when they were students. Mm -hmm. And they were young and they didn't know anything. Mm -hmm. And they didn't use any kind of mm -hmm. And still, they were married for four years before she became pregnant and had a child. So when we went home, I she said, you know, it took the Robertson four years mm -hmm. before she got pregnant. Maybe we should think about it now. So we stopped using contraceptives. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the month, she was pregnant. So we had our first child a little bit more than, just slightly more than the end of December. The fall. We got married at the end of November, and we had Carol in December the 7th. Wow. And you were living in Philadelphia at the time? We were living in Philadelphia. Yeah. I was teaching in the Philadelphia schools when we got married. Nestor was teaching in a suburban school. Mm -hmm. From why did you guys decide to come to Yellow Springs? <clears throat> I, had, I was just finishing my doctorate studies at NYU. Mm -hmm. And while I was studying at NYU, I was also an instructor there, so I was teaching at NYU. And they had offered me a position after I got my doctorate to continue in the education program at NYU, which I assumed we would be taking. At that time, we had two children, two small children. And we were faced with the dilemma of continue to live in New York City, which we found a very unhospitable place for young children, or moving to a suburb and then commuting. <coughs> and one day, one of my colleagues, who was also one of the doctoral students who was finishing the same as I was, and who was an instructor in the program, said, I have a job interview coming up uh, with a, 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 what do you call it, a, a vice president from Antioch College who's looking for a position. And I said, I wasn't looking for a job particularly because I thought I had one. And I said to him, you know, when you're finished with the interview, I'd like to talk with that man because Antioch at that time was one of the most interesting colleges in the country. And I'd like to talk to him about it. And Charles said, okay, that'd be fine. He told me where and when it was. Uh, so he had his interview, and then uh, he introduced me to Boyd Alexander, who was the, acad the academic dean of the college. Uh, and 
I said, do you have time to talk to me? So that they want to tell me about college. He said, I have another appointment up in Columbia. And I don't have any real time to spend. So I have to get on the subway and go to Columbia. So I said, well, I'll walk you over to the subway. And we can talk all the way over. It's got a 15 minute walk. Mm-hmm. And we talk some more. Well, a week later, they invited Charles out to uh, an interview. What any other pattern was at the time was invite the three top candidates to the campus. And they would be interviewed, they would meet the faculty, they would meet the students, and then they would select one of them for the job. So Charles came out for the interview. He came back. And he said, well, they brought me to the job. He said, I'm not sure I don't think. He said, what's the matter? He said, well, he was a single guy. He said, I'm in psychotherapy. And I don't really, at this time, want to leave my psychotherapy. He said, also, he said, I'm a gay man. And I don't know how a little town out there in Ohio it's going to be a good place for a gay man. It'll be, do you know, that yellow screens and center of homo social activity. Yeah. So it wasn't at that time. So he said, I don't think I'm going to take the job. Okay. So he called Dean Alexander and told him that he didn't want the job. Alexander said to him, you know, we did not like the other candidate. But I was very impressed by your friend. Do you think he would take this again? After 15 minutes of talking to so, him. So, uh, I said, well, you should talk to him about it. So I was in there for me and said, do you want my, I didn't have to come out for an interview or anything. He said, do you want the job? I said, let me go home and talk to my wife. Okay, I went home and I told him, that's right, okay. We left and we got to go. So I told him up and said, well, we're going to come. <laughs> and then I went to the dean at NYU. And I said, I know I've tentatively signed up to be on the faculty here, but I've got this office and I think I'm going to He said, that's a very good idea. He said, you take that and you stay out there for two or three years. And then you can come back here and we'll be able to pay you a better salary than I can pay you now. So we took the job. So I came out in September. First time I'd been in Ohio, first time I'd been in Ohio. We didn't have a place to live. I found a room that I could rent for several weeks that I stayed here. I settled and looked around for a place to live. Housing was very, very tight. And I had a colleague who had, was really actually what was it, then a faculty house, a faculty owned several houses, which was, used to let new faculty live in. And he had a second floor, which he was facing you not using. So he said, You can live here while you're looking around for another place. So Esther and the kids came out. And we, moved into that center. and we were there for about a month, and then we found a little house on one of the streets I could rent. And we got at that house. And then Esther got pregnant with the third child, which was Jay. And a faculty house opened up. What happened is when the faculty lived in that house and they were new, once they got tenure, they expected to move out into their own. So they would be eternal. So the faculty house opened up and we moved in there. And we lived there for seven years. And then we, got our house. Then we built our house and moved in. Is that the house that you're living in? That's the house we're living in So we came here in 54 and we moved into our house in 62. But the interesting thing about my story. Is that I never applied for any of my full time jobs. They always came to make it. 
because my first job teaching in the Philadelphia school, my dean from from the college said, "There's an opening here, and you can go there." <laughs> <laughs> I don't think many people can say that about their lives. So the week is, well, not, not today, especially. Yeah. Um, how do you feel about the direction that technology is going in? Um, I think I like, like all things, all change. You know, there are gains and losses. But basically, it's, it's a favorable day. We're developing better communication, mm -hmm. basically. And communication is a good thing. Uh, right now, with the state of our country and the state of my my state of Ohio, I'm not happy with where it's going. So I, I, I hope and respect that the temporary thing and that the better path will go resume itself. Mm -hmm. um. As a teacher, do you think the exponential access to information is a good or a bad thing? The, the, the exponential access to information is a good or a bad thing? Um, I think it's a good thing, but it, it's, um, I think you're mislabeling it. The actual access is not exponential at all. Mm -hmm. The technology may be exponential, mm -hmm. but the ability to use it and, and to make it practical is very slow. Uh, back in the uh, 50s, famous psychologist named B.S. Yeah. Skinner. Yes. Skinner was the rat. Yeah. He was sure that teaching would be to be changed by the sea. Mm -hmm. And he invented a teaching machine, uh, which was very primitive. You know, considering what was available at that time mm -hmm. in terms of schools. Uh, and each time there's been a new development, the computer and supercomputers, what have you, the prediction has been that these are radicalized classes of education, but they haven't. Schools are not that different now from what they were in 1920. Now, there are big changes. Now, if you look at your district, your, your senior paper is probably much, much more sophisticated, uses much more abundant sources than my doctor's dissertation. Because those things are available to you in a way which is not possible when I was writing. So, um, there is a general belief that we have been dumbing down education. That children don't know as much as they used to in one hundred. It's not true. But what they know may be different. Mm -hmm. And when they don't know some of the things that we used to know, we say, oh, it's coming down. But the fact is, what they don't know is probably not necessarily anyway. Uh, so education has become much more sophisticated than those things without that. But our methodologies have not really been significantly changed. And I'm not sure that they will. I think there was a famous teacher named Hopkins one year. And he was a kind of philosopher. I don't know what he did. But anyway, he said that good education is a great teacher on one end of a log and a good student on the other end. And that's still true to a great extent. That good teaching is an interactive process between student and teacher. And putting more intermediaries between them is not necessarily helpful. Like putting iPads in school systems. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, the teacher gets a lecture. And students don't attend the lecture, but they'll uh, go home and read it on their computer. Uh, they get some things and they get some things. I agree. Right. Um, just one last question. If you could impart one piece of knowledge that you've learned over the course of your life to future generations, what would that be? Be nice to everybody. <laughs> No longer a threat.